Welcome to the Ben Wiersma Show on SVK, where we dive into the topic of diversity, equity, and inclusion within the restaurant space. I'm your host, Ben Wiersma, and I'm super thrilled to be here for our first episode of our second season of the Ben Wiersma Show. We've got a great show packed with a lot of information for you here today, and I'm excited to welcome our guests on, so stick with us, uh, and we'll be right back. Awesome intro. Awesome, right? Yeah, thanks so much, uh, uh, Chef Chris. So, um, you know, I want to start off, I want to welcome you. Welcome, uh, Chef Thank Chris Galarica uh, to the show. So, Chef Chris, um, entrepreneur, author, public speaker, podcaster. Uh, you know, Chef Chris is uh, a, uh, renowned for working with kitchens and electrification mm -hmm. and the founder uh, and culinary sustainability consultant for Forward Dining Solutions. So, you know, as the country's foremost expert in commercial electric kitchens, uh, Chef Chris works with manufacturers, brands, uh, designers, uh, the list goes on, chefs to create lasting, sustainable kitchens and culinary ecosystems. So, Chef Chris, um, you've also worked on projects including the world's first fully sustainable university campus, mm -hmm. which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, Microsoft HQ, as well as a number of other uh, institutions and education facilities. You've also worked under certified master chefs and culinary Olympians, uh, which is just a fantastic uh, accolade. And you've worked at a number of prestigious uh, establishments. So Chef Chris, you use your experience every day to help educate uh, the industry on how to successfully run kitchens uh, for years to come. And I'm excited to really uh, get you on the show here and dive into this conversation around, you know, creating this kitchen environment with a sustainability mindset. That's really what we want to do here today. So, um, you know, welcome to the show. And, Thank uh, you for having me. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just to kind of start off here, you know, I, I always like to get a sense or a, a feel for, um, you know, how did you get started in the industry, Chef Chris? Mm -hmm. And um, how did you get started in kitchen electrification? Uh, on both counts, totally by accident, right? So I uh, started in this industry when I was 16. Uh, really, when I was 15, I was a busboy. And I got started in the kitchen because I kept getting in trouble for going into the kitchen and, pick, and talking to the chefs. I loved talking to chefs. I love picking their brains. I love food I, as far as as far back as I can remember. So finally, they just said, you know, you're an awful bus boy. Why don't you get back there? So I started to go back there, started to cook, learn how to cook. And I will tell you, I was awful. Uh, people all, all often say like how they were like a prodigy in cooking. No, I was awful. So it, uh, it took a long time to kind of understand what was going on. And I just kept loving it more and more. I finally decided when I was 19, I was going to be going to culinary school. Uh, and at the time I was living in Florida, which I hated because I just loved the cold. So I applied to every culinary school I could think of that was north, that got winter. And I just let, you know, fate take me. And uh, since then, I've had an incredible career. I'm very, very lucky, very, very blessed. And how I got started in electrification was I was uh, I was brought on to helm the Chatham University's Eaton Hall campus, uh, which was to be the first fully self-sustained university campus in the world. And to do that, they wanted to build an all-electric kitchen, which I was admittedly against. Uh, I never worked with electric appliances. My thought was those coils, which are awful. So I went ahead and just fully embraced it. Like this is what my client wants and I'm not one to shy away from a challenge. And uh, we were pleasantly surprised. I was blown away by how much power, by, by the power that we had, the precision that we had, how much comfortable the kitchen was, just all these things that can go on and on. And so working in that kitchen, I never intended to be a consultant. It was just, uh, you know, I got to learn how to build a kitchen, how to design a kitchen, how to choose equipment, how to work with contractors, how to work with all these different, these different people. And then in 2018, Microsoft called and said, hey, we're looking to do something to what something akin to what you did there. Uh, we don't really know much about it. Figure we pick your brain. So we did. We chatted for an hour. We said our, our goodbyes and that was it. Uh, that was September of 2018. And then in November, got a call from uh, the engineer on that project. 
and he said, hey, thank you. I've been trying to do this for three years, one one-hour conversation with you, and they're all on board. Would you consider doing this for other other companies? I said, sure. And then we that's kind of how the company was born. So I uh, started the company in 2019, June 2019 is when I got everything official. Uh, signed my first contract in August, and that was it. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's a great story, right? And um, I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we're up here in Canada where it, it tends to be a bit cold in certain areas. So <laughs> you're, I know you said you uh, you enjoy working in the cold. So uh, I love we, share that, we share that love of, uh, of that climate. So oh, that's sure. fantastic. You know, I think it's, it's um, you know, I think it's a great conversation around how sometimes we find ourselves in these situations that kind of choose us, right? And end up mm -hmm. becoming, you know, a passion that, um, that, um, you know, parlays into something uh, really substantial. So, um, Chef, you know, one of the, what I wanted to kind of um, learn from myself here on the show today as well is, is maybe get get your in, uh, your input on the benefits of electrification. So sure. you, know, you spoke about some of the speed and just kind of the, uh, the power itself. Right. But, um, you know, so I, I guess, you know, what are the benefits of electrification? And then, you know, how does that really contribute to that sustainability uh, in the work environment? Right. Sure. So first and foremost, when you remove combustion or when you remove thermal sources from your kitchen what you're removing is things like carbon monoxide carbon dioxide sulfur dioxide uh soot smoke you know particulates like formaldehyde is also a byproduct of burning natural gas so it it uh those are things that go into our lungs, right? I don't care how good your hood system is you're directly over that flame you're going to catch all that so what's so in creating an electric environment, you're creating a healthier space for pregnant women, for the elderly, those who have, you know, maybe asthma, things like that, or those who have survived COVID, who, as we know, severely diminished lung capacities. So you are creating a healthier environment. And now your building is not working as hard to maintain temperature. Also, the, because there's no thermal sources, even if you overboil, say, cream, it's not going to burn or it's not going to create those rings you just wipe it off hot soapy water which means now since you're using hot soapy water to clean essentially everything you can reduce your cost on chemicals and now because your equipment works so much faster your dollar per labor hours through the roof and since we're having a hard time finding people to actually work in restaurants it means that you can cook a lot more with a lot less staff the tune of nearly double the stats on that are for, for a 35% efficient gas range and cook 38.6 pounds of food per hour with an induction about 90% efficient, which is average at best, is we're talking 70.9 pounds of food per hour. So nearly double. So all that kind of ties into how do you make it more sustainable? Like Because now you're making the environment a more sustainable environment. For so long, we try to keep things like the status quo and it obviously hasn't worked we've been kind of just beating our guests be sorry beating our staff because of the crippling demands of our guests so now there's a reversal we're now trying to take care of our people mm -hmm. so we can't so we figured out how to pay people right now we need to figure out how to make the environment more sustainable more comfortable like i, I was sharing with you guys before the show my kitchen never hit 74 degrees fahrenheit despite the fact that that when we took those readings that the, the outside temperature was around 90 degrees Fahrenheit all week. It was a perfect summer week. So it was cooler in my kitchen during production next to my ovens than it was outside. So all that combined just makes it a more sustainable environment, right? And because you're using less energy, I mean, yeah, you're using electricity, but you're using it much more efficiently than you would be gas which as i said on average is 35 percent actually probably at most is 35 percent efficient hmm. wow yeah i think there's there's definitely a case like even with those numbers looking at the sustainability factor of, of cooking it right so there's this conversation around where the food comes from is it transported does it get to the restaurant in a sustainable way you know um produced local whatever 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 that is but then you know we're cooking it in kind of uh, an old school way of doing it Right. Where this this electrification piece is really, you know, contributes to that sustainable conversation. So, yeah. And if uh, I can yeah. add, uh, if you are, say, an Asian restaurant and you get a eliminate your gas walk for an induction walk, you can save nearly a million gallons of water per walk. That's a huge oh. savings. 
huge savings, huge savings, right? And I think this all contributes to that conversation around talking about what you're doing with your guests as well, right? So mm-hmm. educating your your staff, but also educating your customer on hey, right. this is what we're doing to reduce our you know our footprint. I think that's a fantastic conversation. So, right. Right. so I guess uh, what would be your advice for or, or next steps for a restaurant that's maybe looking at their sustainability? You know, is kind of making some of those steps. Um, you know, how do they get started? Like, where where do you kind of go for this? Uh, is it something that has to be you know done from the build up? Is it a retrofit? Um, maybe you got some advice on that. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, like kind of examine your own. Um, like your own situation, see what's right for you. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this for everybody, although I wish we could. For instance, here in, in the states, if you're doing all electric all electric restaurant here in West, like in West Virginia, the energy mix is far dirtier. You're going to be putting more pollution out than if you if you didn't. So it all depends on where you're at, and all depends right. on what you want to do. Check your values, check your situation. But you know, shameless plug, call us. Like we offer a thirty like a thirty minute free consultation to to kind of walk you through what what kind of like so we can understand what's going on and walk you through some steps and mm-hmm. then from there we can figure out how to put together a team together to get you to where you need to be so we have all the connections necessary so we're kind of a one-stop shop we can find you the engineers to to begin the energy modeling to figure out how much this was going to cost you so before you even know before you even make a move you can understand uh your your energy bill essentially before you even Mm-hmm. You can get there. So yeah, there's a lot that goes into it, but we're here to help. Nice. Yeah, no, that's really good. I think, um, you know, it's good advice, right? To get that team around you and understand, you know, what are those kind of parts that need to, you know, need to be put in right. place ahead of time in order to uh, right. make sure that it's it's the right decision for you mm-hmm. both uh, financially and, and that it's achieving the results that you want, right? Right, right. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank so uh, so Chef Chris, I, um, I ask every guest of mine, um, you know, what are you most excited for about the restaurant industry kind of into the future? Well, as we know, the restaurant industry is struggling, right? Uh, we have, haven't have really done best practices in such a long time. What I'm excited about is us finding our passion, finding our resiliency and kind of figuring out a way to evolve. We're not going to have stacks of resumes that we can just you know people can come in and out we're gonna have to learn how to keep our our turnover low right we're gonna have to keep we're going to figure out how to work more sustainably uh and you know keeping costs low also means probably working with farmers working with your local community working with as many people as possible and also by cooking more sustainably and reducing how how your building runs by going all electric if you're able to so what I'm most excited about is all the changes that are coming and I'm excited to see how we as an industry perform mm. and how resilient we could be because I was telling you guys before the show 2019 Berkeley banned gas for new construction right in just 2 years it's gone to over 50 cities in California it's the entire state of New York has banned gas uh Washington uh, like a state in Washington Sorry, a county in Washington State has banned gas. There's over 80 places in the United States that are just going all electric or reducing their carbon footprint by over 80%. And that's just two years. There is a huge renaissance happening in this country. And I'm quite frankly, it's about time. Uh, we are starting to catch up to, to our brothers and sisters overseas. And before chefs out there are like, how dare he talk about getting rid of gas? You know, you can't produce quality that's the mentality we have to fight against that's the mentality that we as an industry have to kind of correct because truth be told every international culinary competition is all electric the boku store the culinary olympics all of them some of the best restaurants in the world are all electric noma just one number one all electric uh fat duck pineapple and pearl in dc alinea in chicago per se in new york uh, all of thomas keller's restaurants all electric the the days where you can say, oh, well, this isn't quality, is just BS. I mean, there have been restaurants overseas that have been all electric for decades. Like I can tell you right now, the, the Moulin de Mugen in, uh, in France, that 2002 chef uh, Gerald Ford went to work there. They were all electric using induction. This, 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 this concept isn't new. It's just new to this country because we've been so 
focused on maintaining the status quo because of the the most because of the worst uh, phrase out there, which is if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Mm. Because if you think like that, you never stop to examine your own beliefs and and see how can I make things better. It's just it's just trying to keep a broken system. So I'm excited to see us grow to evolve and to kind of take on these challenges in a way that we've not, we haven't done since the time of Escoffier. So I'm really, really excited. Yeah, that's fantastic. Really, really well said, Chef. I, uh, I think you're right on there with, um, with just changing that, that thought of that status quo, right? You know, the mm-hmm. restaurant industry is all about creativity and innovation and we need right. to look at all areas of it. Right. The whole industry, really that holistic ecosystem approach to say, you know, what are those things we could change mm-hmm. uh, physically in our locations to really help? Um, yeah. So- Yeah, and I'll even go so far as to say as uh, my business partner, really good friend of mine, uh, you know, Greenbrier graduate, he he once said to me and it kind of put everything into perspective. He said, if you were to take a RoboCoop back in time and and show like the native people in Mexico what a RoboCoop can do, they would throw the mocajete off off the cliff because because it's about evolving, it's about growing. Yeah. We've never shied away from a challenge. We've never shied away about experimenting with new techniques or ingredients, but all of a sudden we talk about cooking on induction, we get mm-hmm. scared. Yeah, and, it's a, and chefs have to understand that it doesn't matter if you're cooking on a campfire or on a gas range or on induction, culinary technique doesn't change. Mm-hmm. So embrace the technology, it's gonna make your life easier. Fantastic, really well said, really Thank well you. said. Well, Chef Chris, thank you so much for uh, for joining us. Um, and, you know, it's just been fantastic to dive in this conversation around sustainability in the restaurant space and using electrification. Uh, it's been great to have you on the show. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me and take care, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. So we're just going to take a, uh, a quick break here and then we'll be back with our, uh, our next guest. Craft Hazelnut Spread is here with the classic taste of roasted hazelnut, skim milk, plus a touch of cocoa. Perfect for a quick breakfast or an indulgent start to your day as a decadent anytime snack on the go or even at the office or to create richly satisfying desserts putting a new twist on your old favorites. Kraft Hazelnut Spread is made with no palm oil and is low in saturated fat. Chocolate Hazelnut Spreads are here to stay and we're one of the fastest growing dessert ingredients growing 18% in food service versus the previous year. And with snacking still a powerful trend, the demand for chocolate hazelnut spread-filled pastries remains high. Elevate your breakfast, innovate your desserts, or do both. It's the convenient new way to enjoy the taste of chocolate hazelnut. Craft Hazelnut Spread. Fantastic. Well, welcome back. Welcome, Chef uh, Chef Joe. It's uh, fantastic to see you. You do. Thank thank you very much for having me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I can't say how excited I am to have you on and, and to dive into this. But uh, um, you know, first off, um, I do want to I do want to introduce yourself. So, so Chef uh, Joe uh, Martin Vattengall is um, the chef, author, restaurateur, uh, community builder, and uh, recipient of the Order of Ottawa. Uh, and as well as being a, a proud Canadian, he's also the member of the culinary uh, fraternity from God's Own Country. Uh, Chef Joe has worked in several notable establishments, including the Park Hyde in Toronto, uh, and was executive sous chef at the uh, Crown Plaza Gatineau in Ottawa. So Chef Joe uh, is now the owner and executive chef at uh, uh, Thiley, the restaurant on Cooper Street. I I got that correct, Chef. And um, Thiley, yeah, in Oklahoma. Yeah. Thiley, Thiley on the corner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, That's fantastic. Thank you for that. So Chef Joe, alongside other restaurant owners, um, have organized the Ottawa Restaurant Fund with an intent to raise over $250,000, provide financial assistance to downtown restaurants uh, that are really losing money due to, to the ongoing uh, demonstrations in and around Parliament Hill. So, Chef Joe, uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time out. I know uh, you're, you're a busy guy right now with, uh, with things happening in, in your area, but um, you know, I did want to get maybe just a sense of, of how things are right now and, and what's, what's going on. It's it's really hard. Um, we were in downtown Ottawa. We were suffering for the last 23 months. And, you know, when everything was supposed to be reopening, uh, this protest demonstration, so-called, you know, it came in and choked us, you know, in downtown Ottawa. So uh, when we were supposed to reopen, 
then this convoy came in and it really hurt the downtown and you know the government and the people in the city hall and all that they were saying you know avoid downtown core mm -hmm. so we were really suffered and that is why you know it's been the third week now almost 20 days into the protest and we get empty restaurants for lunch and dinner you know it's not the best scenario but um, that is why we started off with this um, Ottawa restaurant fund uh, just to give whatever we can uh, to the restaurants you know because we were stuck with a lot of inventory uh, to reopen and there was a lot of people don't get me wrong there was a lot of uh, people in downtown but they were not coming into our restaurants you know because first of all they didn't have they were not supporting masks and they were not supporting the vaccine passport and we were in between the ocean and the devil you know we were we have to follow the regulations and law of the land and we cannot let them come in so we were people the downtown was crowded but mm -hmm. restaurants were suffering and a lot of restaurants you know which opened during covid time they were not eligible for um, a lot of these subsidies and rent subsidies things like that so we wanted to give whatever we can and we are sitting at with 90000 plus dollars and we are going to distribute it in a week so it was really bad because we messed up the new year's eve we valentine's day supposed to be one of the busiest uh, weekend for the restaurant during the uh, valentine's time you know so and downtown was not in the best situation to have that kind of business so we wanted to help that and it is still continuing to grow and we will be distributing the funds as soon as possible by next week um in downtown out of our restaurants that's our plan yeah, it's fantastic right you know it's it's yeah. that much needed support right you know you'd mentioned it's really you know the the 23 months even before what's going on right now has been really tough on restaurants and so this just it adds is. to that the pain and especially in downtown you know and governments should look into revitalizing the downtown core because mm -hmm. the guy down the road with the dry cleaner and you know small coffee shops where they depend on lunch businesses it's not nobody here now so you know it was really sad and it's only a small um core in downtown got really affected and you know everybody else is having all right business with the 50 percent and you know starting tomorrow it will be 100 percent so we hope this will all over and it's all behind us and we can continue to grow yeah, yeah absolutely that's fantastic that's yeah. fantastic well yeah. chef you know um there's a couple of things i, I do want to dive into while i while i have you on the call you know i'm i'm always excited yeah. to kind of learn where my guests got started in the restaurant industry you know our show really yeah. focuses on uh, the conversation around you know diversity and inclusion in the restaurant space and and equity yeah. and um you know yeah. How do we kind of, you know, take the diversity of our community, of our staff, of our backgrounds, ourselves, and really create a, a community there? So, I mean, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd love to kind of know how you got started in the restaurant industry and and then we'll... For we'll sure, there. Ben. Yeah. Yeah. I born and brought up in a place called Kerala, which is the southwest tip of India. That's why where it's called God's own country, because, you know, Kerala is as a, everything in there but it's a south southwest strip and you know it's not very famous for um, its chefs or the culinary till now but because it was laid back and you know the people are highly educated so growing up in 90s or in 80s you know and end of 80s and 90s beginning you know when i was finished my grade 12 i didn't had much opportunity in india because there was a lot of people a lot of people are unemployed and everybody was pursuing a degree in engineering medicine or computer science and things like that but which i was not very much interested i didn't in our culture we don't go and work in a restaurant as a part-timer in those days you know so i didn't have much experience from the restaurant but my mother was a working mom so i used to cook in in our house you know helping making a coffee making a snack for my family 
things like that i slowly learned cooking in in from my house and when i finished the 12th grade i wanted to choose a career which was not very much in like demand but we i wanted to use my skills so i picked this hotel school for 3 years of um cooking and you know learning about the restaurants the ho- the whole hotel industry it's called a diploma for 3 years in hotel management so i did that um from 91 to 94 in india um and during that time i was not even studying culinary but i was doing the service i was learning about french wines and you know uh, spirits i was learning about the front office of the restaurant or, 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 or for the hotel housekeeping even i was learning french the hotel engineering uh, hotel accounts all these things were part of my syllabus so i studied 3 years and during the second year i realized i have the skill um uh, to be a cook or to be a chef so i i cultivated my skills and i learned you know it's like driving the more you cook you more you better a chef you know or a cook mm-hmm. so we practiced and you know in very good training we were doing you know the french cuisine we were looking up to escoffier book we will we were looking into all these western cookbooks and learning from them and you know trying to do what we can do and learn and from 94 i started in indian hotels to start working and um, in a year i went i got an opportunity to go to saudi arabia where i was working with a british chef i was working with a italian chef japanese chef um all these and you know in saudi arabia everything was flowing flying in into 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 saudi arabia fresh mus- mushrooms from holland you know fresh asparagus cheese mm-hmm. from france uh, all these were coming in the flight every day so i got the opportunity to learn lot lot of um, the western cuisine and the ingredients we were playing with the most expensive caviar uh, the f- salmon all the fish you know whatever you need you can get it so i worked there for 4 years then saudi arabia was not the country where i wanted to stick around for long so i applied for immigration to canada and in 1998 i got the immigration after long interviews and things like that i got the immigration to come to canada i came to toronto you know it's funny to say but uh, now i think back you know from young and um, blore i walked all the way north uh, to eglinton every restaurant i was dropping in my resume is you know like mm-hmm. take it i don't know doesn't matter i don't know no clue or how the restaurants work in toronto or in canada so i just applied everywhere by the time i got home i got a call phone call from um, uh, chandros which is um, uh, his name was um, uh, chef uh, mark tuet and uh, pit uh, um, i don't know his uh, chef's name but they called me and they said you know interesting resume me can we hire you uh, can, can you come to work with me so i went there i worked 3 days of uh, trial test you know like they mm-hmm. wanted to see what i can do so i did 3 days of work and the third day night they called me into the office and they said you know joe we're going to offer you a job uh, you want to take it as a vegetable uh, cook andra mentier so i said yeah for sure i will take it and you know from there i started my career in fine dining you know we were making like 150 cows a night um everything was from scratch you know making the mashed potato the leeks and all that and after a couple of months you know i wanted to have a steady job with the better hours and you know so i applied for royal york toronto and they hired me after interview and trial test they took me mm-hmm. as a breakfast cook and they want a reliable guy to come in and cook at from 5:30 to 2 o'clock in the afternoon and in toronto you know and i took that and it was a good experience in a big hotel uh, nice kitchen and um, from there i went to park hyatt so every two years you know i tried to learn more things from different chefs so i i take turn so i went to 
Park Hyatt. I worked there as a restaurant chef. Um, I got promoted to a, even a restaurant chef. Then I then I got married in 2001 and I wanted to move to a smaller city. So my one of my friends offered me a job in Windsor Casino. And I went to Windsor Casino as a chef de uh, cuisine for a, one of the restaurants there. And uh, during this uh, September 11, you know, 2001 happened, you know, the Windsor was being a border city depending on american clients you know this the yeah. border closure and all that happened so the business was down then i wanted to move anyway from windsor because it was not a big city for culinary so i applied to ottawa crown plaza and i came here and i worked three years in uh, in crown plaza during that time i i certified myself as a chef de cuisine uh, in Canada. So I took that certification. I did that test. I did that um, food um, preparation and all that. And uh, I passed that one. And uh, in 2004, I started a very humble restaurant called Coconut Lagoon uh, with my cuisine um, from Kerala, mostly the dishes from, from Kerala. And um, very humble beginning in a small place, um, grow up the business you know we slowly build up the business and thank god you know after 15 years we we ran the restaurant and you know on the 16th year of uh, having the restaurant we had a very bad fire in uh, back in uh, 2020 during the covid time you know may mm -hmm. and um, the completely the restaurant was um, uh, under fire and you know we we demolished it and we are rebuilding as we speak and the restaurant is expected to open by june this year uh, but in 20, 2018 i i pivoted myself to open up another restaurant in downtown ottawa where i'm sitting right now um this is um the my second restaurant which is called thali um, and the concept was a little bit different before covid uh, this place was only serving lunch and we had great business. We were serving like 200, 150 people in two hours. And we mm -hmm. had long table, long communal tables where you can just come in like a employee and the federal government, you know, you have only 40 minutes. You cannot mm -hmm. wait for a good table or anything. So we had long tables and people used to come as groups. They come wherever there is seat, they have it. They no need to order anything but we will serve you Indian thalis, which is like everything in a plate. It's like a small buffet on a plate in a platter. So the rice, the curries and different protein, you know, dessert, the bread, the papadam, the whole, whole nine yard. So we will serve that one. And in mm -hmm. 20, 30 minutes, you are out of your lunch and you can keep going and keep go and, you know, working, you know. So that was mm -hmm. the trend before, before COVID. And when the COVID hit, this downtown become deserted, you know, nobody was here. And, you know, that time we, we wanted to utilize this kitchen and we started the, giving some food for the needy people. Then the, the whole idea of Food for Thought Cafe came in and we started serving people 200 meals a day to the people in need and to reduce the in, food insecurity in, in, in our um, in Ottawa so mm -hmm. we, we did that one and you know we are still doing that those ones for the community and it's been very helpful now we have two three chefs working for that and you know some employees working and feeding feeding meals it's not from my restaurant but it is from another kitchen right now so we are glad it is going well yeah that's <clears throat> I mean it's amazing work right you're um, yeah. you're you're in tune to to the need of the community, right? The restaurant community yeah. out there and, and what yeah. they need. I think it's just a fantastic story. So, um, you know, Chef, I, I, I wanted to ask you um, and, and I think you touched on it a little bit. But, um, you know, how do you feel community building supports your staff and your business? So, you know, with the, the activities that you're doing, um, you know, obviously it, it raises the restaurant's profile, but have you seen any noticeable changes in your staff or anything like that? You know, how's, how is it? The, our, 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 you know, everybody is happy. I kept during the pandemic also, 
I during doing all these initiatives, you know, I was busy, mm -hmm. so I could employ my employees more, you know, rather than mm -hmm. cutting there and putting them on layoff. They were working, and we are doing. We believe in good karma. If you give something, even if it is a small thing, you know, you will get it back. You know, like doing good things to the community helps mm -hmm. us to grow also. So we are happy the staff we kept pretty much everybody even mm -hmm. though i lost the restaurant the second the one restaurant with the fire i could move all the staff here and we were busy we were doing pretty much good business during the last mm -hmm. summer and you know coming fall and all that so staff is good they 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 do they believe in karma they are working mm -hmm. and they are being recognized you know so as a team we are happy and food insecurity is the is the worst thing and i would recommend you know all the restaurants what we can we have is food and we play with food so giving away at least a meal to a mm -hmm. person who in in need will you know uh, fill up their hearts and fill up our hearts so that we can we can pursue and we can grow more and you know and support the community that's that's our message and we are very happy and the ottawa community recognized that and a lot of people didn't even know that there is people who are hungry and don't have a, at least one hot meal a day people don't recognize that you know but we we made that awareness to the people and now people are you know helping whatever ways we can and reduce the food waste you know a lot of food are we are wasting you know we should put that into a good use and make mm -hmm. a hot meal and yeah. we cannot we cannot tell somebody who is hungry right now that oh we fed you yesterday today we cannot feed you you know because hungry is everyday phenomena you need to feed and once you feed even a student at school or you know people on the street if you feed them they are relaxed they are more you know they they become calm and you know mm -hmm. it's good for the society in in general so that is what yeah. i believe and i continue to do that no that's fantastic i think i think you're you're on a, a very good point there around just the, the the humanity of it right you know everybody needs to Simple. eat you know i always say yeah um you know food and education are really the great equalizers right yes and um, we all we all need to be educated in some capacity we all need to eat and 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 um, I yeah. do think that it is it is a great equalizer, and it really does bring a community together. Um, you know that story you shared about the long tables and everybody coming down. I'm excited. I think yeah. we're all excited to have a return to that at some point. And um, I hope you know, that we're it's we're all coming. Going. It won't be too long. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. it's exciting times, right? So it um, is. It is. But but we we realize a lot of things. You know, when the mm -hmm. this lockdown sh came came. You know, we realized that how much food we have in our freezers and fridge and, you know, we were, you know, and the big menus and things like that. So people are going towards the sustainability now and people are rethinking, you know, we should have a small menu, not too much of food waste, things like that, you know. So I think it's an eye opener during this pandemic time. And I think I know the restaurants are struggling but uh, with the, all these you know restaurants will be much efficient and you know do much but let me tell you out there you know to people restaurant industry is not is going to try try more and you know do good because that atmosphere we we share a lot of emotions you know in a restaurant you know you you celebrate your anniversaries you know birthdays you celebrate things and even you if you are having sorrow like you are down people come to restaurant and share with the people so this these things are needed in the community and i mm -hmm. think once the pandemic and all these restrictions are over you know people will come out and you know we need that kind of vibe in the society where you can enjoy and laugh and you know um, mm -hmm. share it with each other i think I think there is good hope for good restaurants to be sustainable and you know run for long. Yeah, after this. absolutely. 
I mean, I agree yeah. with you. Uh, I agree with you full heartedly on that. I think there's really um, a, a great resurgence. And I think you're right. You know, restaurants have had to adapt and change and, and it's not necessarily yeah. go back to the same. You know, if you reduce your menu size and you're more efficient, it's easier on your staff. Yeah. There's all these benefits, the food and the waste, timing. Yep. And the timing, everything. It's just so much more efficient. And, and I think it offers a better guest experience, right? You know, um, the guest, you know, just feels it's fresher and there, there's all these advantages yep. to it. So, yeah. big, big, big we don't, we don't, we, we don't have to follow what we were following, you know, long hours, you know, late till night and, you know, till 12 o'clock to customer sitting. We need to respect the people who are working. They had a yeah. tough time also, you know, that is why a lot of people are leaving the industry, but there is no mm -hmm. ones that are coming. So, but we don't have to make the same mistakes, you know, like long mm -hmm. hours. Even if there is one customer sitting in the restaurant, like two, three people are waiting for them to yeah. leave, you know, in late in the night, you know, so mm -hmm. this is all eating up to, into the staff's family time. So I mm -hmm. think with all these um, uh, pandemic uh, time, uh, people realized how, you know, we don't have to do all these things to make it e earning. And I think it even the guests also get that perspective and, you know, they are very accommodate. Mm -hmm. you know and they they also support these uh, these restaurants you know and the places where we work yeah absolutely yeah. That's fantastic yeah. well chef i like to ask all my guests um kind of in closing you know what are you uh, what are you most excited for for the the restaurant industry in the future as I, as i mentioned earlier this is the place where people come and celebrate and you know mm -hmm. share the lo losses or anything and we are there uh, i uh, in in the industry for the 17 years having a restaurant i know who had baptism kids who had baptism then they become graduates you know they are still coming to the restaurant mm -hmm. so being a good host where the people can come and tell us you know like joe this has happened in my life you know i'm moving away or you know we are going this i'm retiring all these we are part of their family and they come and mm -hmm. share if you are a good host uh, people will come and share and when by sharing it you multiply the happiness and reduce the sorrow or the feelings you have so i i recommend you know and i wanted to really stand and talk to the customers once all this all over you know without the mask and seeing their face mm -hmm. and talking to them uh, i'm looking forward and you know, this is the things what we know and we wanted to continue to do this and we enjoy and we take good pleasure uh, serving and, you know, cooking and um, making everybody happy. And those smiles and the big laughter in the restaurants, that is what we were looking for. And I hope it will come back. And I'm 100 percent positive that, you know, people out there, you know, stay on, hang in and yep. we will have the 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 thing back everything will pass you know the time will pass mm -hmm. you know it will we will be back stronger okay. and better yep. that's that's a great opinion. message i love uh yeah. i love that message john so, thank you so much chef joe for uh for being on the thank show today i really much. appreciate it. really really thank you very much it. and uh, happy cooking you know <laughs> everybody <laughs> thank you yeah happy cooking i like that yeah thank you so much chef well, this has been a, a fantastic uh, episode where we were able to dive into topics around sustainability in the restaurant environment and how to really create a, uh, a place where individuals want to work and be. And uh, Chef Joe on the uh, on the show was amazing to learn about his career and, and how he got into the industry and the work he's doing with the Ottawa Restaurant Fund. I think it's just a fantastic mission and, uh, and a really great story. So, so this is uh, the end of our first uh, episode of season two of the Ben Rusma Show. And um, like I said in the beginning, thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to do this show and, and have this as an opportunity to really talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion within the restaurant industry and the larger community out there. Uh, thank you all for joining. And remember, uh, share food and care for one another. Mm -hmm.